Coming up, protesters gather in South Dakota and boarding schools are under scrutiny. We have more. Plus, Congresswoman Teresa Ledger Fernandez talks about government funding for Native communities. I am Aliyah Chavez. Join us for those interviews, plus headlines from the ICT newscast. Arizona PBS is proud to support Indian Country Today. For six decades, we've provided television programs and now digital content. But we go beyond that, sending outreach teams across Arizona, offering workshops in language and literacy, family engagement and community outreach, and supporting tribal communities with early learning and school readiness resources. Join us at azpbs.org. This is the ICT Newscast with Aliyah Chavez. Amadawa Hopa, thank you for joining us. We continue our coverage on the historic visit by an indigenous delegation to Rome. This week, Pope Francis met privately with boarding school survivors to talk about the traumas of Canada's residential schools. Leaders held a press conference after their meeting to debrief. Martha Gregg is a residential school survivor. She says she had one request. A genuine, heartfelt apology would be a, a step, a stepping, a first step to start wanting to start healing. So that is something that um, I personally, as a former residential school student, that would mean a lot to me myself, but more so for my uh, fellow former students. And a lot of them have now passed away. Natan Obed is the president of the Inuit community organization who traveled to Rome. He said the conversation occurred with a translator and outlined more. There was a, a lot of conversation about residential schools and uh, the negative impacts of residential schools on Inuit and the intergenerational trauma aspect of residential schools. Uh, there were also um, positive conversations about um, the role that the Catholic Church can play in reconciliation and also in Inuit communities moving forward. On Thursday, a delegation of First Nations people will meet with the Pope. It is estimated that more than 150,000 Indigenous children were taken to Christian-run schools in Canada from the 19th century until as late as the 1970s. In New Mexico, sales for recreational cannabis are set to begin on Friday. Already, two tribal nations are throwing their names into the business. Last week, the Pueblos of Picaris and Pewaukee signed an intergovernmental agreement with the state. This means the tribal nations will be able to regulate their own marijuana enterprises on their lands. According to reporting by Source New Mexico, these two Pueblos are the only ones to have publicly pursued cannabis sales and production. Because cannabis is still an illegal substance under federal law, the Pueblo said their intergovernmental agreement is important. They said they hope tribal sovereignty will be respected to prevent any kind of prosecution in their new venture. A tribal nation in Montana is celebrating a restoration of its lands. Last week, the Confederated Salish and Kootenai tribes announced it is fully managing the Bison Range. The area was formerly known as the National Bison Range. It was restored to the tribal nation by legislation in December of 2020, but it has taken two years for the transition period. Chairman Tom McDonald said in a statement, Our reunification with this specific buffalo herd means more to us than we can can express. In addition to our wildlife management, the CSKT wants to ensure the story of our people is told at the bison range. The Tribal Nation and the Fish and Wildlife Service will continue to partner together to ensure the land and resources are being protected. The tribe has even remodeled its museum to reflect its special connection to the bison, bison range, and it expects to celebrate the occasion in a formal ceremony later this year. 
a gift to help Native elders. Last week, philanthropist Mackenzie Scott donated $4 million to the National Indian Council on Aging. This is the largest single donation the organization has ever received since it was formed in 1976. NICOA was created to address issues like elder abuse, financial exploitation, and health disparities. The gift will enable NICOA to dream even bigger in the development of creative, innovative, and responsive programs that create change. That's what Larry Curley, the executive director, said. During this pandemic, Native elders have experienced loneliness and depression, according to the council. Scott has donated money to other Indigenous organizations. Over the weekend, the National Lacrosse League's Buffalo Bandits celebrated its Native American Heritage Night. Players wore beaded medallions. According to the team's social media pages, the medallions were made by Jackie Snyder. At the game, Maya Miller, a master's student, received a scholarship. The team posed for a photo with wooden sticks made by the Mitchell brothers. The team has several Indigenous players, including Frank Brown of the Seneca Nation. A lot of guys in my position, right? Lacrosse is like the greatest companion in life. You know, you, you learn so much about life through pursuing excellence in this game. The artwork was made to bring awareness to Native American Heritage Day. And those are the headlines for the ICT Newscast. Coming up, we speak with Congresswoman Teresa Ledger Fernandez about her work advancing Native issues in Congress. But first, we learn about protesters in Rapid City with Kevin Abresk. Stay with us. Over the weekend, Indigenous people marched in protest in Rapid City, South Dakota. Organized by the Great Sioux Nation's Tribal Chairman's Association, protesters marched on the Grand Gateway Hotel because the owners of the hotel banned Native people from the property. Joining us is the managing editor of Indians.com, Kevin Aberesk. Hi, Kevin. Hi, Leah. Thank you for having me. So I understand you were there on the ground in Rapid City. Tell us what you observed um, at this protest. Sure. Yeah, this was a pretty uh, incredible event. And obviously the events that led up to this uh, were even more startling. Uh, but uh, the event itself on Saturday uh, essentially involved about a thousand people uh, who took part in this march and uh, met at the hotel where uh, this um, had all started. Um, so how it began was um, there was a rally at Roosevelt Park in Rapid City, South Dakota. About, uh, oh, maybe 800 people or so were there to hear different people speak, including Mark Tilson from, uh, and Nick Tilson from uh, Indian Collective and a number of other tribal leaders, uh, including uh, Harold Frazier from the Standing Rock, I'm sorry, from the Cheyenne River Sioux Tribe and uh, tribal leaders from, from the Oglala Sioux Tribe and the Crow Creek Sioux Tribe. So. From there, um, the, the people marched up uh, a, a street called Lacrosse Street in, in Rapid City. This kind of uh, is a street that cuts through a very heavily populated uh, native part of town in Rapid City. And um, people carried signs. They carried things that, that read like uh, Indians Allowed, Land Back. People wore black T-shirts that read Good Indian and Bad Indian. Those were a reference to a statement made by the Grand Gateway Hotel owner, Connie Yuri, who, of course, when she banned Native Americans from her hotel, said it was because you couldn't tell the good Indians from the bad Indians anymore. So people wore good Indian and bad Indian, so that maybe she would know. You brought this up already, but tell us how we got to the point where Indigenous people are showing up, as you mentioned, in really large numbers to say that this was wrong. How did we get here? Absolutely. Well, this all started on March 19th. It was a Saturday. Um, there was a 19-year-old Lakota man, Quincy Barrow, who shot another young Native man, Myron Poirier Jr., at the Grand Gateway Hotel in Rapid City. A day later, Connie Yuri, the hotel's owner, posted on Facebook that she would be banning all Native Americans from the hotel because she could no longer tell the difference between the good Indians and the bad Indians. Local activists, including the Indian Collective, responded. Uh, they accused her of violating the civil rights of all Native people by banning them from the hotel. They, mar they organized a march to the federal courthouse in Rapid City, where they filed a federal civil rights class action lawsuit against Yuri and the other owners of the Grand Gateway Hotel. Then, of course, uh, the march and rally was held on Saturday. 
Um, and the march ended with uh, tribal leaders delivering a uh, notice of eviction uh, to Connie Yuri and the other owners of the hotel. And they actually marched inside the lobby of the Grand Gateway Hotel to deliver that notice of eviction. And they posted a banner over the uh, hotel's uh, highway sign as well uh, to let people know that, the, that she was evicted. Um, and, you know, also earlier on Saturday, a number of tribal leaders met at a conference center there in Rapid City to talk about other possible actions, including potentially uh, moving the uh, Lakota Invitational Basketball Tournament from Rapid City to another community and possibly moving the Black Hills Powwow out of Rapid City as well. All actions that they hoped would uh, uh, essentially force the city of Rapid City to understand how important uh, Native people are to that community and what kind of impact they can have economically uh, if they choose to do that. So, Since all of these events unfolded, has anyone from the hotel or uh, the owners of the hotel uh, said anything in response to what's happened? Um, the owners of the hotel have said very little. Nick Yuri, who's Connie Yuri's son, um, did say that uh, he didn't stand by her words. Um, but as far as I know, uh, there has been no official uh, sort of decision to allow Native people back into the hotel. In fact, there have been Native people, including from the Indian Collective, who've tried to uh, rent hotel rooms there and have been denied. So when this rally was happening outside of the hotel, were the doors just closed? Like, was it operating fully inside and there was just a giant protest outside? You know, I actually didn't get to go inside. I was right outside the door with my camera um, getting some photos, but the door wasn't closed. I do know that. I did see uh, one tribal leader from um, the, the Lower Brule Sioux tribe. Uh, he walked in, the chairman of that tribe walked in uh, first, I believe, and the other tribal leaders followed suit. But uh, but as far as I know, the doors were open. I don't, I don't think anybody had to try to force their way in or anything like that. Uh, there were police standing just a few feet away, probably about a uh, half dozen or so Rapid City police officers standing you know, less than 50 feet away or so. So um, I don't think they, anybody believed they did anything illegal by walking into the hotel. I believe the hotel was open at the time. Well, Kevin, while we have you here, I want to switch gears because I understand that you just won a, a major journalism award. Congratulations to you. Um, tell us about what the award is and um, the special connection that you have to the uh, award who it honors. Sure. I appreciate that. And uh, just a, a minor point of clarification, this wasn't actually an award for my journalism. Um, although maybe that was included in, in why I was given the award. But uh, this was the um, Leo Yankton Award for Indigenous Justice. And this was uh, given to me last night by the University of Nebraska-Lincoln uh, Department of Ethnic Studies. And uh, the, the award is named for a good friend of mine, uh, Leo Yank Yankton, who passed away last August from throat cancer. Um, and Leo Yankton was, was just really an amazing person. He was a modern Lakota warrior. He gave his whole heart, including, you know, indeed every fiber of his being to his people. He would give away his belongings to those he felt needed more. He needed them more. He once gave away his Toyota Tundra pickup truck, which he prized and loved to his uncle Laverne living on the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation. Really barely a day went by when some, someone would call on Leo to help them or someone they knew who needed clothes, furniture, or a place to live. Leo would drop everything he was doing to help that person and call on everyone he knew, setting up GoFundMe drives and hosting live streams to call on his friends and relatives to step up. He was a Sundancer, a nonprofit director, a community organizer who hauled wood and water to Standing Rock, spoke in distant places like Sweden and England about the plight of indigenous people in America, and helped save our local Indian center. Um, as I mentioned, he passed away uh, last August, August 26, actually, of last year. Uh, but despite that, his work here isn't done. Um, and I'd encourage everyone watching this show to visit and like the Intertribal Spiritual Lodges page on Facebook. That's the nonprofit that Leo founded. And it will be the vehicle that many of us who, who he left behind will be using to carry forth his visions for improving the lives of his people. And uh, we definitely have a lot of work ahead of us in order to do that. So. Well, Kevin, thank you so much for being here and please join us again. Absolutely. Thank you, Aaliyah. Great to thank you for having me.
Indigenous leaders and residential school survivors traveled to Rome to meet with Pope Francis this week. In the U.S., ICT national correspondent Marionette Pember traveled to a former boarding school in Wisconsin. It was the one her mother attended. Marionette has been covering boarding schools in the U.S. for decades, and she joins us now to share more about her experience. Hi, Marionette. Hi, Aaliyah. Tell us about your visit to the boarding school that your mother attended. Sure. Well, actually, I visited I visited her boarding school many times, but on this particular trip, I visited the mother house of the Order of Nuns who used to oversee the boarding school, St. Mary's Catholic Indian Boarding School on the Bad River Reservation in Wisconsin. And the Order of Nuns are called the Franciscan Sisters of Perpetual Adoration. And their mother house, which includes a convent and um, uh, facilities for some of the aging sisters, as well as a magnificent church is collectively called the Mother House in La Crosse. So they uh, allowed me to visit. I spent some time there and I wanted to, to look at archives that they might have about uh, their work at the school. They founded the school in 1883 and it operated as a boarding school until 1969. So it's nearly 90 years that the sisters operated the school there in Wisconsin. And when you were talking to these nuns, what kinds of questions were you asking them and what was their response? Well, interestingly, many of them claim to have no memory or very little memory of it. And it's sort of uh, um, when you ask, uh, particularly leadership, who is arguably younger, um, they will say, well, this is new information for us, which is uh, for Native people, myself included, a little bit um, difficult to understand since it looms so large in our lives and continues to. Um, and is something that for them, you know, is part of a distant past. Although Native people have been approaching many of these uh, parochial uh, uh, schools, many of these Christian missions, Catholics and other um, Christian organizations about their work. For them, it's it's ancient history, but, you know, as I said, for us it is. And I think that there's they are under suddenly under greater scrutiny and pressure to deal with this. So this is a good thing, I think, from the perspective of Native researchers and uh, Native families and people who may have been affected by this time. Do you think that these nuns will at some point have to face the reality that more people are going to have questions about what happened at these schools? I mean, it sounds like they're saying that they had no um, direct connection to these kinds of uh, situations, but still, um, because they work there and they live there, it sounds like they have um, a different kind of connection. I think they are realizing now that that capacity was, you know, very damning to native culture and native language and did have her, you know, although I think it saved people physically because there were times um, during this era, particularly during the depression when people were, were you know, really, de they were desperate, I think on some reservations. I know certainly on Bad River times were very tough as my mom would have said. So people, you know, it was just a bare bones physical survival. So I think they did help feed children and, you know, house them, children who maybe otherwise wouldn't have had anything. Um, and I think that is very much the perspective that they prefer to embrace. Um, and I think it's a real hard concept for them to wrap their minds around that, although they may have saved some people physically, um, you know, they participated overall in a policy that really uh, was very damaging and muting to Native, uh, to the Native worldview, to our uh, self-image and to our culture. I have one last question for you, M.A. Um, I mentioned earlier in our newscast that there's been a delegation of indigenous people who have traveled to the Vatican to meet with the Pope. Is that something that surprised you that that meeting finally happened? And can you kind of reflect on um, maybe what you've heard about how those interactions have gone? Um, yes, you know, it doesn't surprise me that they that they are meeting with the Pope. The Pope has met with indigenous peoples before. This group of uh, the, the delegations are from Canada. There's three separate delegations. And originally the Pope was to have traveled uh, to Canada to meet with people. And I think it was something to do with COVID that he opted not to. So they made the decision to go there. And they are specifically asking for an apology um, from him, you know, an official, um, you know, Catholic 
church writ large policy uh, apology. But to be honest, I I. I really have my doubts that that will be forthcoming because I think the implications would be too great on the terms of, you know, reparations beyond Canada, specifically to the United States and to other uh, countries. I think that perhaps is the Catholic Church's great fear is that there would be a, a, a large financial cost. So they're very, very guarded. So they have met, these delegations have been meeting with the Pope all week and they will have uh, some collective final meeting tomorrow, Friday, April, first in Rome. Well, M.A., thank you for being here, and we'll look forward to your story. Oh, thank you so much for having me, Elia. Earlier this month, President Biden signed a $1.5 trillion spending package into law. Part of that funding is going to help Native communities. Joining us today is Congresswoman Teresa Ledger Fernandez. She is the chair of the House Subcommittee on Indigenous People and will break down some of these efforts. Hello, Congresswoman, and welcome back to our newscast. Hello, and thank you for having me back. It's really good to talk about these positive developments uh, and finally seeing some increased funding for Indian country as we try to meet our trust obligations. Part of this funding is going to help a, a Navajo community get some water. Tell us about that project and how much money they'll be getting. So that's the Navajo Gallup uh, Water Supply Project. Uh, and we hope that they will receive sufficient money to basically complete the project. And the project um, is, uh, it, it's fully authorized now. So it was authorized. And as everybody knows, you can authorize a project in Congress, but you really can't get it in the ground and water flowing until you appropriate the money. So we appropriated full funding for it. We do know that there will still be the need for additional funding because of cost overruns, but boy, we're gonna be able to build the laterals that will take it to the various chapter houses and communities um, and, and that will really get it done. We were able to secure uh, about 63 million um, that I was able to get through my community uh, uh, supported projects for the for it. Uh, and then that will be in addition to the full funding that we received in the in the infrastructure bill. So that's the great thing is what we're doing now is we're putting together the infrastructure bill with the omnibus with the community support projects. And that's how you get creative and make sure we're taking water to all of those deserving Navajo homes and Gallup residents. It's it's not just for Navajo, it's also good for all of the communities uh, along the way. I think you summed that up really well, um, talking about how these processes sort of work in terms of actually getting water to people. Um, at this point, are you uh, aware of how soon people can actually uh, see the fruits of all of this labor? Well, they're going to be seeing the foods pretty quickly because uh, we are. I was actually out at one of the construction sites, and we have those big pipes that carry water being put in, and they're doing it in a they're doing it in a phased approach. So it depends on where you're at, how quickly you receive the water. But we think that the full funding will allow them to move quickly on it. So people should be receiving water that they didn't have this year and then other communities next year and, and so forth. It is a long, you can't, you can't spend this much money without uh, having it uh, occur over a long period of time. Part of the omnibus spending bill, um, of course, reauthorized the Violence Against Women Act. And you've spoken about this so often. Um, so when you heard that this was going to be included as part of the bill, uh, what was your reaction and how are you feeling now that, you know, it's signed back into law? I was relieved because we know uh, that uh, Native women, Indigenous women are really, they prey. And when tribes do not have jurisdiction over non-Indians to pro pers prosecute those who persecute, right, that we, they make them pray, right? It's like it's open season. It's horrible. And we needed to make sure we got that, that jurisdiction back. We needed to make sure we got the funding back so that we could do the kind of outreach uh, that we needed. And what I also like is the fact that states like New Mexico, we're setting up a task force that will help 
with missing and murdered indigenous women, that we'll be able to work uh, co con in, in cooperation and collaboration with the federal funds and with tribes, because that's what we need is we need everybody to recognize that this is a crisis and this is a crisis that we can solve if we decide it is a priority. And what you saw in the ominous post bill is we decided it was a priority. We got VAWA reauthorized. The other part of this spending bill is sending humanitarian aid to Ukraine. I'm curious if you've had any conversations with tribal leaders about how important that was to them and maybe what they had to say. Yes, you know, I've had various meetings across my district with tribal leaders and here in DC, and there's always a moment where they acknowledge that crisis. I think that tribal leaders know what it's like um, to serve in war, because many, as you know, Native Americans participate in armed services at a higher rate than, than others. And so they know what war is like, many of them. And they also know um, what it's like to, you know, be persecuted and to try to have your land taken from them, because that is a, a sad history of ours. And so they are very, very supportive of uh, the Ukrainian people and what we're doing in Ukraine. And I need to give a shout out to this president we were coming from a place where the prior president wanted to take us out of NATO, wasn't sending uh, the military aid uh, to Ukraine. And this president has united the world. Uh, he has created bridges rather created bridges that unite rather than walls that divide, right? And 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 we have such unity in NATO and across the world for the support for Ukrainians. And, and our tribal leaders have taken that moment of silence, taken that moment of recognition to acknowledge that as well. Well, Representative Teresa Ledger Fernandez, thank you so much. Well, thank you so much. And that's a slice of our Indigenous world. For more news, visit IndianCountryToday.com. From all of us in the newsroom, stay safe, my relatives. I am Aliyah Chavez. Sometimes you got to take a stand Just because you know you can oh, You got to run, you got to run, you got to run.